So it's a great pleasure to have oh, I should stop uh, Professor uh, Mark Trodden from uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania. He's the Professor of Physics and the Department Chair and also the co-director of the Penn Center for Particle Cosmology. And this is the 62th QASTN Zoominar uh, talk. And uh, we are very thankful uh, to you for giving this contribution. And uh, we all are welcoming you from India. So thank you, Mark. And you can start uh, from your end. Okay. Uh, is that working? Yes. That's working? Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me. It's very nice to be here. Um, I, uh, Sayantana asked me to give this lecture. Uh, he, he suggested that it should be aimed at sort of graduate student level in the field. And also that um, it should be quite long. Um, so I've done my best. I've put together a, a sequence of things that are connected to dark energy. I haven't worried too much about whether some of it is old or new or, uh, or current topics. I've mostly just tried to present things that I think will be useful, uh, particularly for students, both sort of learning in the field, but also those hoping to sort of make first contributions in the field. Um, okay, so let me get started. So I'll give you a little bit of motivation and background and particularly I'll focus on the problem of cosmic acceleration as a way to motivate the general notion of dark energy. Uh, and then I'll mention some possible approaches to dark energy as a solution to cosmic acceleration, cosmological constant, dynamical dark energy, modified gravity. And then I'll try to focus on a common effective field theory type approach to understanding many of the theoretical issues that come up when studying these issues. Um, so I'll focus in on some theoretical issues, particularly um, issues of theoretical consistency, which I think there's a part of the field that pays very close attention to these issues. I think I'm one of them. And there's a part of the field that does not seem to pay attention to these issues. And one thing I would like to get across in that part of my talk is that they're very serious issues and people should be paying attention to uh, and then um, one thing that will come out of this EFT type approach will be uh, an understanding of something that's needed to understand how um, massive gravity and any kind of gravitational modification or dark energy for that matter need to have a screening mechanism in order to really be able to fit precision tests of our theories. And I'll talk a little bit about screening mechanisms and then I'll use a proxy uh, for massive gravity in particular and talk about what are called Galileans. Uh, and then I'll move on a little bit to talk about tests, how you're supposed to look for these theories in data. I'm not someone who spends my life looking at data, but I'll take say a little bit about how you do that and what the promising ways of thinking about that are. And then I'm gonna, if I have time, I'm gonna switch fields completely and use just uh, just the words dark energy to talk about some recent ideas in early dark energy as an explanation for cosmological tensions. And uh, I'll highlight some very recent work that I've been doing with uh, collaborators, postdocs and students. Um, for the first part of the talk, where I'm talking about cosmic acceleration and particularly theoretical constraints, uh, there's a somewhat old now, five years or so reference uh, here that I think might be useful to a lot of people, this uh, report of, uh, physics report that we wrote back in 2015-2014. Okay, so a little bit of background uh, so that we're all on the same page. Um, we all know that the universe is expanding and a question that is natural to ask is what does data tell us about how it's expanding, what the expansion rate is. And, you know, if we look at uh, recent data, recent here meaning in the recent past, of course, uh, then you know this picture here shows us the uh, expansion history of the universe in various models plotted to go through data, and you'll see that you know here is very recent, very uh, data that's taken 
from galaxies that are close by, but here are the data that came in from type 1a supernovae two decades ago or so now. And it's this data first that showed us that not only is the universe expanding, i.e. getting larger over time, but in fact, it's accelerating, that it's speeding up. And without this data here, you can see that all these lines go through this little set of data here. And that's why we really had no notion that the universe was accelerating before then. But with this data, one can really quite uh, uh, well separate out the different models and see that the universe is accelerating. And of course, there are many other pieces of data now from cosmology that fit this picture. So where does the notion of dark energy come from? Uh, well, our model for explaining the universe is general relativity. And if we trust general relativity, then there's uh, an equation that arises. I have a question, sorry. So yeah. in this plot, in the horizontal scale, this time is uh, it's the power's negative, what it corresponds to? Is the, minus the, the horizontal is billions of years from today. Okay, okay. No, but it is in which scale, I'm asking. Uh, what do you mean in which in which scale? I mean, it's billions so, of years. Is, is it a physical time or conformal time, I'm asking? Oh, physical time. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, physical time. So, so today is at zero, yeah. and this is 10 billion years in the past, 20 billion years in the past. Yeah, perfect. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is very, and indeed, if you look uh, at, in fact, the thing I said, a dot, and the dots that are appearing in this equation here are also physical time. Cosmic time, I should say. In other words, it's the time that is measured by co-moving observers in an FRW universe. That makes sense? Yes, yes, perfect. Sure. So if we trust general relativity, then one equation that we get from the Einstein equations is this equation that is precisely the equation that tells us how this A double dot, whether the universe is accelerating or not, should behave. A, of course, is the scale of the universe. It's the scale factor. And we see that it's related to the, the sum, really, over all energy densities and pressures of all things in the universe. And so from this, you see something very simple. You see that if the universe is accelerating, if A double dot is positive, then the only way that can be true is if the total rho plus 3p in the universe is negative, and therefore p must be less than minus one third rho. And so if general relativity is correct on all scales in the universe, all large scales, then the universe must be dominated by some strange thing, and that thing should have p less than minus one third rho, a very odd type of behavior. And this is exactly what we call dark energy. Okay, that's that. Uh, my slides are not advancing. Give me a second. Oh, okay, now we go. So it's common in cosmology to write whatever that stuff is in the following way. You write P is some W times rho. We call this W the equation of state parameter. And then just plugging that into here, we see that the criterion for acceleration is not any more P less than minus one third rho, it's rather W less than minus a third. So just a bit of bookkeeping because I'm gonna use this equation of state parameter going forward. And now if you really ask what data tells us, the thing I showed you on the last slide was just supernova data, but now of course we have much more uh, uh, precise data. Here you're seeing results from the dark energy survey uh, three-year supernovae results plus the microwave background results. And you see that these are somewhat orthogonal to one another. And if you plot this in a plane where vertically here is this parameter W and horizontally is the total amount of matter fraction in the universe, then you see that the contours home in close to minus one, but with fairly decent error bars, but more importantly, certainly far away from minus a third. And so the universe most certainly is accelerating. And if you fit to this data, you find that W is minus 0.9 or so, or almost minus 0.1, plus or minus you know, some, some error bars. And again, uh, coming back to other data from the DES collaboration, the Dark Energy Survey collaboration from 2019, um, 
uh, putting together the dark energy survey with the baryon acoustic oscillation measurements, supernovae. Some of these things may mean something to you, they may not, but you know, if you're an expert, you'll know what these things are. If you don't, just understand there are very different ways of measuring the dark energy. So Mark, a lot I have of a question. Yeah. So what do you mean by less than minus one? It's a minus 1.0. It's an observation, I know that. But if I just want to like use the theoretical notion. Like... I'll get there. I'll get there. If, if, I don't, if I don't return to tell you about that in the next few slides, ask me again. Did you get my point? What exactly I want to ask? Like, Say that again. Huh? Yeah, so like we know that uh, like for from lambda CDM and all, it is almost approximately minus one or something like that uh, within the error bar. Now, this kind of observation is showing that it is more negative than minus one, like a little bit more. So a lot of people, I, why I just asked, like th there was some speculation that some tachyonic model or something like that, uh, whether those kind of thing will uh, give this kind of equation of state or not. So, I understand. Yeah. So you know, I'm going to talk about that in my talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so you. Just give me a few slides. And yeah, if I yeah, don't sorry. answer. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, uh, it, won't, it won't be tachyons that do it though. It yeah. won't, it's yeah. um, but anyway, this is what the data tells you. Yeah. So just, this is just fitting the data to a very simple model of dark energy with some, some W. Yeah. Um, so now we come on to what can explain this. So I will mention the things you're talking about now. So the first thing you might think could explain this is the cosmological constant, okay? So what is the cosmological constant? Well, of course, we all know that Einstein introduced this as just a constant into his equations, but nowadays we have a, a somewhat more sophisticated version of view of this. Um, the vacuum, you know, the quantum mechanical vacuum is full of vertical, virtual particles. Those particles carry energy. And if you ask using the equivalence principle or Lorentz invariance, what the energy momentum tensor of those particles should be, you find that it's proportional to the metric, okay? So this corresponds to what is called a constant vacuum energy. And you can try to figure out how large that would be. You can do a quick and dirty estimate of this by just saying, suppose, the only thing in the universe is the standard model. We model those fields as a collection of independent harmonic oscillators and we sum over their zero point energies. And we cut off at some high level because we know standard model cannot be the only thing in the universe. We find out that the energy is around whatever the cutoff is to the fourth power. And then if you ask what should that cutoff be, the most conservative estimate of that cutoff would be a TeV. In fact, it could even be as large as the Planck scale, but Certainly, it's going to be at most at least a TeV. And the problem with that is if you then ask, you know, from those observations that I told you on the last slide, how big do you need this cosmological constant to be to explain the observations? The answer is about 10 to the minus m Planck to the fourth. Uh, and if you ask, sorry, sorry, if you ask what this lambda UV is here, if I put a TeV in, you get it's 10 to the minus 60 m Planck to the fourth. If you ask what the observations tell me I would need lambda to be, the answer is 10 to the minus 120 and Planck to the fourth. And there, of course, we are wrong by 60 orders of magnitude. And so certainly the cosmological constant could be the explanation for the acceleration of the universe. But if it is, we do not currently understand why it would have the size that it does. And of course, this problem existed in physics way before we discovered that the universe was accelerating. It's a huge and an entirely unsolved problem in fundamental physics. So at this stage, I would say we are pretty much stuck on the cosmological constant. There's no known dynamical mechanism to make the cosmological constant small enough to explain the accelerating universe. And in fact, worse than that, there is a no-go theorem due to Weinberg that says that many of the obvious things you would try to make the cosmological constant small, tuning it, balancing it against other things, all of those fail. And so if you want to be the first person to explain why we have a very small cosmological constant and therefore why the universe is accelerating, you're gonna be faced with some fairly hefty 
theoretical barriers to get over before you do that. Now, I'll just have a comment here on one suggestion that people make, which is that uh, maybe the value of the cosmological constant is explained statistically. Uh, and the anthropic principle provides a logical possibility to explain the size of the cosmological uh, Hello. constant. Hello. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Is there a question? Uh, no, I think somebody called and sorry for the introduction. That's okay. Um, so the notion here would be that maybe the universe consists of many, many, many different minima in energy. Some of those would be very high energy minima, some would be very low energy minima, therefore some would have large cosmological constants, some would have small cosmological constants. And the notion would be that if we had a way to populate statistically such a landscape, then randomly some parts of the universe would be in a large cosmological constant and would expand very quickly. And people like us would not evolve to ask the question, why is the universe expand accelerating? In some, the cosmological constant would be very negative and they would recollapse. And in some regions it would be just right and then it would give rise to the kind of universe we see. And this notion has received added attention in recent years because it's been at least suggested, I would say not proven, that string theory has a landscape of vacua and that the notion of eternal inflation might provide a way to populate these vacua. I mentioned this mostly for the experts in the audience. I won't be talking about this uh, in any detail, but it is one suggestion of how we might get a small cosmological constant. Uh, there are no currently accepted answer about how to compute such probabilities in spaces like this, but there's a lot of serious work going on. And I'm gonna skip this slide because, uh, just because of time. Okay, so if you don't have a cosmological constant, uh, you might like to build a dynamical model. That's what we do in physics, right? We like to see if maybe the accelerating universe is telling us about some new matter out there and we should learn what its properties are. So just a comment on model building, because if you go to the archive, you will find many, many, many papers on dark energy models. Um, I would say that now we are, you know, 15, in fact, more than 20 years, I should say, uh, after the discovery of cosmic acceleration. And at the beginning, when people started thinking about models, it really was sort of the wild west. Uh, but nowadays, meaning that any idea you had was worth putting out there because maybe it would work. But now I would say the bar for interesting ideas is pretty high. And in particular, as I said in my introduction, questions of theoretical consistency and observational viability are really key. And uh, we can't really avoid them anymore. And so in particular, if you don't have a formulation of your idea for dark energy in which you can ask serious questions about theoretical consistency, for example, those models are going to be intrinsically less interesting. And uh, it's harder to get people to pay attention to them these days. So in other words, if you have a phenomenological approach to dark energy at the level of the background cosmology, in other words, if you have a model that you think you've thought up and it shows an accelerating universe, that can be a good starting point for modeling dark energy. But unless you have a further fundamental development, a sort of a Lagrangian or something from which we can ask questions about structure formation and theoretical consistency and things like that, Ideas like that cannot really be much more than reparameterizations of the expansion history. So that's something to keep in mind when you're constructing models. So what could dynamical dark energy be? Well, if you think dark energy is dynamical, then it's some form of mass energy component. And as I said, it isn't enough just to model this as a perfect fluid. In cosmology, we like perfect fluids because they're simple. You know, we write a perfect fluid this way, for example. But really, our only known way of describing at a fundamental level what's going on these days is through quantum field theory. And so the starting point you might take if you wanted to write down a dynamical dark energy model would be to write down a Lagrangian. And so let's stick to scalar fields for now. I write down some, Lagrange, some action for a, Lagrange, for a scalar field, and the scalar field Lagrangian has this simple form. It doesn't have to take this form, as we'll talk about in a while. Uh, that's when I'll get to your question, say, Antan. But for now, let's just write it this way. And then you compute the energy momentum tensor and you stick it into the Einstein equations and you ask, what would I need to happen to the scalar field 
in order to get the kinds of acceleration that we know are needed from the observations. So Mark, I have a question, not related yep. to this, but somebody have yep. actually asked a question from the audience. Can quantum fluctuation yep. be similar than the Planck length? Uh, what do you mean similar? I, I can you ask the question again? Somebody have asked question that can quantum fluctuations be similar than the Planck length? I didn't get the question actually. Oh, yeah, so it's smaller, so, smaller. Smaller than the Planck Smaller, Planck. smaller, okay. Be smaller than the Planck length, yeah. So, of course, in principle, yes. Um, but the way that we think about um, the fluctuations that I wrote down on the last slide is, if you want to be conservative, all of these things, I'm going to say a little more about this in the coming slides, but the conservative way to think about this is that the theories you're thinking about are effective field theories. So they only apply below a certain scale. And then you trust fluctuations up to that scale. And then you say, well, above that scale, there's some new physics, and I don't know what that physics is. I remain agnostic to it. So in the example I gave you, I was trying to be uh, careful. So I could have said... Uh, I have fluctuations all the way up to the Planck scale. I could have said even above the Planck scale, although if, if the entire theory held to infinity, I could just renormalize them away. But as long as there's a cutoff there, then I just get them up to the cutoff. And what I did is I said, let's treat that cutoff as the, if, as the cutoff for the standard model. In other words, I know from colliders that we have a very good effective field theory that describes the universe up to the electroweak scale. So I'm just going to use that. So then I could be confident that I, I trusted the theory there. If I had let that cutoff that I call lambda UV go up to the Planck scale, the problem I have would be even worse. I would not be wrong by uh, 60 orders of magnitude, I'd be wrong by 120 orders of magnitude. And if I let fluctuations be smaller than the Planck scale, I would even be worse than that. So I was being conservative. Does that answer the question? I'll be I'll assume that. Are you happy with the answer? I'm not getting any answer. I'm going to keep going. Yeah, so, thank you, sir. Continue, please continue. OK, OK, good. Um, so so uh, what did I was I saying? Oh, yes. So, so what, what would I need the scalar field to do? So the notion would be that maybe there's some principle that we don't understand that sets the absolute cosmological constant to 0. And then this scalar field would be just like inflation with some very, very big differences. So the essential differences are it's like inflation. So it's a scalar field whose slowly rolling energy gives you acceleration, but the scale is much lower. This is acceleration today, not in the early universe. It has no minimum because I don't need to reheat the universe. Uh, and so it can run off forever. And so these ideas, this very simple idea that you take a scalar field, you make it behave like inflation, you give it a small slope so that the energy density is approximately constant, so that the equation of state, you can scratch out these kinetic energy parts and just get close to minus one. Good mark. And all quintessence. I just want to clarify one thing. So like uh, when people do inflation and all those things, people are very much bothered about the fact that when it starts, because like, uh, that will reflect in the number of foldings and all. Okay, so here uh, uh, people don't do such kind of things because uh, you are actually not interested in the early universe. You are looking for some late time universe physics, but the models that V5 uh, taken care. So it, that model can be some phenomenological model which is coming from different theoretical backgrounds, maybe some string theory or maybe some other things. So what is the energy scale of this kind of potential? When, when the it energy scale rolling? The energy scale of this potential is exactly the energy scale I told you you needed for a cosmological constant on the last slide. In other words, 10 to the minus 60 and point to the four. Okay, so like, uh, so it's possible to get such a low scale uh, starting with a very high energy theory? Well, we don't know. I mean, we don't even have the high energy theory, right? We have no reason to think that, that for example, string theory is correct. 
we, we don't have a high, a high theory here. This is phenomenological, but the advantage is that it, it would be effective field theory. So you would have to ask all the questions of theoretical consistency about a model like this. Um, uh, but it would be great to have it come from some top down theory. And there are ideas about that. People do write down, I would say somewhat contrived dark energy models coming from string theory. But uh, at present, I'm just presenting it as a phenomenological model. But, uh, is it here important that when the fields start rolling here for the dark energy? Well, typically what happens to fields on potentials is that fields on potentials typically remain stuck on their potentials until their mass is of order of the Hubble scale. And then they start rolling. So for a very light field like this, it would just wait to roll until today. Okay. But indeed, you can, you can propagate back the behavior of these fields and ask how they behaved in the fairly early universe, say back to the CMB, and that can have important consequences for the evolution of the universe. I'll say more about that in a while too. Okay, sure. So if you have a model like this, what are the issues and advantages? Well, there are some issues. Ideas like this, this comes to your question slightly, require a very extreme fine tuning to keep the potential very flat and the mass scale very low. So this is the question you were asking, uh, Santa, what is the scale? The scale has to be very unnaturally low. And in, in particle physics, as I'm gonna explain in some detail, it's difficult to do that. And so sometimes you need extra symmetries to enable you to do that. I, I won't say more about that here because I'm gonna say it in more detail soon. But even if you do that, there are other constraints. Fields like this can have weird couplings to the standard model. They can rotate polarized radio light from distant galaxies. So I mentioned this just to say that even if you have a weird field like this with a very low mass, there can often be very tight tests from observations. And I'm gonna say way more about that. And then there are very more exotic versions of theories like this, which I'm also going to discuss in a moment. Okay. But I would say at present, to come to your question again, there are really no compelling models of dark energy. There are no models that I think scream out, this has to be the correct dark energy model from a theoretical viewpoint. There is of course another possibility. When we, going back to the slide that I showed you on data, we don't really measure W, right? We infer it from looking at the Hubble plot, right? So if you take Einstein's equations and you invert them, you can get this equation. I've assumed here spatial flatness. You can get this equation that uh, gives you the equation of state of dark energy, the inferred equation of state, which you get by measuring omega matter, H and H dot. And then you go to your Hubble plot or whatever else, you, you get omega matter from whatever observations, you read off H and H dot and you infer W. Now, if general relativity is correct, then the W you get by doing this is exactly the equation of state of whatever the interesting matter component that's causing the universe to accelerate is. But if gravity is not GR, then the thing that you infer from this may not be directly related to energy sources. So just to give you a very clear example, and this comes back partly to your question, Santan, a minute ago, if you take Brands Dickey theories, so this is a paper I wrote a long time ago with Sean Carroll and my student Antonio de Felice, um, you can take Brands Dickey theories, which are a somewhat more complicated scalar field model coupled to the Ricci scalar, and et cetera. Then you can show that even if you constrain these theories to agree with all observations, which requires this parameter to be bigger than 40,000, then by making clever choices for this potential, you can get, you can infer that W is less than minus one, this thing you asked about earlier, even though no actual energy source has W less than minus one. You're getting it all from the gravitational components. And so the purpose of this slide is not to sell you that this is a great model for dark energy, it's really not. The purpose of this slide is to show that how we interpret our measurements in cosmology in terms of fundamental physics depends crucially on what the model of gravity is on these large scales. So this leads us to a sort of extreme version of the question I just asked. Uh, you know, a story like this played out over about a 50 year period, over a century ago, uh, when people were looking at 
Mercury going around the sun. And as we all know well, I mean, I'm repeating a story we all know here, Mercury doesn't go around the sun in, a, in an exact ellipse. The ellipse processes in such a way as it goes around the sun. And Leverrier pointed out that, you know, maybe this is due to some kind of dark matter or dark energy. He didn't call it that, but that's what he meant. And so he says, maybe this discrepancy is because, you know, there's a new planet or group of planets interior to the orbit of Mercury on the other side of the sun. And the, they perturb the orbit of Mercury in such a way that when you try to apply Newton's laws, they get perturbed. And so things process around. And we know, of course, that that actually wasn't the answer. The answer, in fact, was that Einstein came along and said, actually, no, there's nothing there. What's happening is your theory of gravity isn't quite right. And once you replace Newton's theory with the correct theory of gravity, then the slight difference between the two is enough to explain what he called the secular rotation of the orbit of Mercury. And so you might ask a similar question about cosmic acceleration, namely, could that be what's happening today? Could it be that cosmic acceleration is really a canary in the mind telling us that gravity is breaking down, that we don't need some new exotic thing like dark energy, but instead perhaps we just have the regular matter we know of and dark matter and the theory of gravity on the scales of cosmic acceleration are just, is just different to general relativity. And we saw a hint of that on the last slide, but now I'm asking it completely. Could it be all responsible to a modification of gravity? So this is a fairly drastic question, drastic suggestion. Uh, so how would you go about thinking about something like this? Well, um, the first thing to understand if you want to modify gravity is what does it really mean to modify general relativity? And to do that, we should probably understand a little bit better what's going on in general relativity. So to do that, we'll approach that from a particle physicist viewpoint because that will lead into my discussion of effective field theory in a moment. In general relativity, the thing we care most about is the metric, Jamie Newton. And the metric is a geometrical object and we normally don't think of it in terms of particles or if you like, irreducible representations of the Poincaré group, but we should. So you can ask, what degrees of freedom are there really in a metric, do you mean if a symmetric uh, two index tensor? And the answer is that there's a spin two degree of freedom, the graviton, the thing we all know about and think of as the particle analog of the metric. But also secretly in there are vector field and scalar fields. And we don't spend a lot of time talking about those in gravity. And there's a very good reason for that. And that's because general relativity pins the vector field and the scalar field in, by the equations of motion to make them non-dynamical. And so the only dynamical degrees of freedom in general relativity is the graviton, H mean. But if you change the action of general relativity, almost any change you do to the action will no longer satisfy this constraint and will free up some of these degrees of freedom. And in fact, there are even more interesting things than this. So just to be clear again, the degrees of freedom that propagate actually depends on the action. It's not enough to say, I have a theory of a metric. What are the degrees of freedom? I have to tell you what the equations of motion are that the metric obeys. In, in general relativity, the action is the Einstein-Hilbert action and the resulting equations are the Einstein equations and they contain constraints like Gauss's law in uh, electromagnetism. And these, as I said, pin the vector and scalar. So if you have another action, if you go from the Einstein-Hilbert action, which only has gravitons, to some modified action, then inevitably you will still have gravitons, but you'll get new degrees of freedom. So the message to take away from this slide is that, you know, one way to explain the accelerating universe is to introduce new degrees of freedom and call them dark energy. Another way is to say, let's play around with gravity and have modified gravity. But when you do modify gravity, you nevertheless introduce new degrees of freedom anyway, typically, just in a different way. So here's a simple example of that, going back to a paper I wrote a long time ago with John Carroll and Vikram Davuri and Michael Turner, where we introduced the F of R models. And so suppose that instead of writing down the Einstein-Hilbert action, just having the Ricci scalar here, I introduce some function of the Ricci scalar. It seems a very innocuous thing to do. And uh, you might imagine that it would not have very large effects, but in fact, it really does. And in fact, any model like this frees up one new degree of freedom. 
The resulting degrees of freedom are a graviton and the scalar field. And in fact, you can ask what is the, if you like, potential obeyed by the scalar field. And if you choose the function f of r carefully enough, you can arrange for it to behave in the way that I talked about earlier when I talked about quintessence. And so, in fact, even just doing this simple change to the action. Mark, this yep. potential is in the Jordan frame or Einstein frame? I'm doing this in the Jordan frame. Okay, okay. This is the Jordan frame. Okay. Yeah. So you can think about this two ways. In either frame, you can see that there's a scalar field. Uh, but it's nice to do it in the Jordan frame because in the Jordan frame, you know that the matter that you're looking at, the, the, um, the galaxies, let's say, fall along geodesics of the metric G. And so it's kind of simple to keep track of what's going on in this way, in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, of course, frames are, are just a change of units, right? So changing frames never changes the physics. There's any, any physical question that is correct that is answered one way in one frame will have the same answer in another frame, always. It's just that unphysical answers can have different questions, different answers. Sure. Um, so this means that actually there's actually, you can show that there's an intriguing class of actions because this F of R theory that I wrote down has four order equations of motion. What that means is that you can rewrite the Friedman equation in a way like this. So the normal way H squared over H naught squared has the normal matter plus dark matter radiation and then something else that contains all the mess of F of R theories. And I've just lumped them into something I call row effect. And you should know that this is a fourth order equation for, and, and you can treat it as a second order differential equation for the function F of R. And so what that means is that if you hand me an expansion history for the universe, including those that accelerate, I can give you an entire family of functions F of R that describe that exact expansion history. That's amazing, right? You can modify gravity in such a way that you actually have a whole family of different theories that give you any expansion in history you want. But theories like this pay a price. And that is that unless you're very, very careful, they have a disastrous disagreement with solar system constraints. And I've mentioned this here and I, don't worry too much about the language I use here because I'm gonna come back in detail and talk about this. So the good news here is even a simple modification of gravity can give you an entire class of accelerating solutions. And the bad news is Almost all of those are ruled out by other observations, which I'll get to. So I, I think I'll skip that. I'm going to skip this too, actually, because of the, the pace I'm going at. You might wonder, um, maybe we can have more general actions. After all, I wrote a function of the Ricci scalar. The only constraint on the Lagrangian in a gravity theory based on a metric is that it be a scalar constructed out of curvature invariance you could just start writing down curvature invariants. And so for example, like we wrote down with my, with uh, Carol and Turner and Damien Eason and uh, De Felice and Murray, uh, you could write down a general function of any curvature invariant, which is scalar, the square of the Ricci tensor, the square of the Riemann tensor, et cetera, et cetera. And you might wonder, maybe there's just some infinite number of gravity theories that give me beautiful acceleration and I never need dark energy. And the answer is no. And the answer is you hit horrible problems. Because unlike F of R theories, in these models, it turns out to be fairly easy to satisfy solar system constraints, uh, partly because the Ricci scalar vanishes in most of the solar system, but the Riemann tensor does not. But these theories, sorry, contain my, I'm having some problem with my slides here and I don't really know why. These theories, as we'll see in a moment, contain catastrophic instabilities known as ghosts. So I've given you sort of a, a, a hodgepodge of ideas here. I said, well, the universe is accelerating. We have gravity, which says that this geometry is related to the stuff in space time. So if you want the universe to accelerate, you can play around with the stuff in space time and call it dark energy, or you can play around with the dynamics of gravity and call it modified gravity. And in either case, it turns out you release new degrees of freedom and there are all kinds of constraints on what you're allowed to do. 
It seems very messy to think about all these different things at the same time, but in fact, particle physics provides us with a common language that we can use to answer, to really talk about all models in a single breath. And so I'm going to, to go to that now, and I'll discuss in some detail then what these theoretical constraints are that I keep mentioning. So how do theorists think about all this stuff? Well, we generally say, well, we don't really care whether it's dark energy or modified gravity. At the end of the day, you've given me a Lagrangian. And that Lagrangian consists of a set of interacting fields. And in any Lagrangian with any set of interacting fields, there are really three types of terms. There are kinetic terms, for example, for a scalar field or a gauge field uh, or uh, fermions or spin two fields, or even functions of kinetic uh, theories like this, very complicated things you could write down. I'm just saying you can write down anything you like that involves these kinetic terms. Then there are what you might think of as self interactions. For scalar fields, these take the form of some potential, perhaps a mass term, a lambda phi to the fourth, for example. You can have masses for fermions, you can have masses for gravitons, you can have different kinds of masses for gravitons, et cetera, et cetera. You can just have masses for gauge fields. You're allowed to write these things down in any Lagrangian, at least at the beginning. And then there are interactions among fields. For example, scalar fields can interact with fermions. Here I've written the Higgs field. Or gauge fields can interact with scalar fields. Or scalar fields can interact with metrics and other fields. Or Traces of gravitons can interact with scalars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's an infinite number of things I could write down, but they can all be categorized one way or another. They're a, they're a kinetic term, maybe a very complicated one. They're a self-interaction, perhaps a very complicated one, or they're interactions among fields, which again, can be very, very complicated. So really, in, from the point of view of a Lagrangian, you give me a theory, you tell me you've got some background evolution you care about, for example, an accelerating universe. You expand the theory out around that background, and now you just have a Lagrangian with a bunch of fields. And now you can ask any question you want without wondering whether it came from a modified gravity theory or a dark energy theory or anywhere else. And so we'll use this language for a while uh, to explore some possibilities. So, I've said a number of times now, you expand this around the background. And if you do so, what me, that means is that any terms like these in Lagrangian can have functions in front of them that depend on time or space. So just to be clear, I'll give you an example in a moment. But uh, the point is that you can write down your general Lagrangian. Now you expand around the background. And in the, exp in ex the background might be cosmological, in which case it's time dependent. And then you'll end up with time dependent functions in front of these when you expand the model around that background. And many of the concerns that theorists have, these theoretical consistency concerns that I told you are disastrous for some uh, curvature invariant models, for example, can be expressed in this language. So here's one of them, weak coupling. You write down a classical theory. Usually when you write down a classical theory, you're implicitly assuming that the effects of higher order operators in the theory are small. In order to make that work, you have to work below the strong coupling scale of the theory. So the quantum corrections are small. Otherwise, you can't trust the classical implications of your theory. So typically what that means is that the dimensionless quantities that determine how higher order operators, the dimension for couplings, which we call irrelevant operators, affect the lower order physics have to be much less than one. Typically, that means that the energies that you're probing in your theory must be much less than the cutoff of the theory. Once you reach energies that are of order the cutoff of the theory, then the infinite number of terms you could have written down in your Lagrangian, all of them in principle can be generated by quantum corrections and can be equally important as the terms you did write down. So you can't trust the theory you wrote down. This is made much more complicated when expanding around things like cosmological backgrounds or black hole backgrounds or something like that because all your kinetic terms, couplings and potentials can have background dependent functions in front of them. And then you run into the following problem. Sometimes you've written down a Lagrangian where you're confident that the terms in front of each, that the coefficients in front of each term are small and that quantum corrections are small. But when you expand around the background, the functions of the terms become large over time. And now you can no longer trust the theory. It's entered the strong coupling regime. 
So to give you an example, suppose I had a theory with two fields in the Lagrangian, one called chi and one called phi, and I had a function of chi in front of my kinetic term for phi. And then once I expand out around some cosmological background, there will be a term in my Lagrangian where chi is its background behavior, which might just depend on time. And then this term has a term in it that looks like this, or some function of time. If that function goes to zero, then my kinetic term gets a very small term in front of it. And that means that my canonically normalized fields all have very big couplings to everything else in the universe. I can't trust the theory anymore. It's strongly coupled. There's a related problem, which is called technical naturalness. The problem on the last slide was to do with quantum mechanical corrections ruining my classical corrections, meaning I couldn't do any calculation in the theory. But there's another problem, which is suppose that you're, you've arranged that your theory doesn't have that problem. So your quantum mechanical corrections are small. They don't ruin your ability to trust your theory. But nevertheless, the theory you've written down has some very, very small parameters in it. Remember when I talked about quintessence, it needed very small energy scales and very small masses. Suppose you need those to remain small. Then it might be that quantum corrections in your theory within, perfectly within control could ruin your couplings. So again, going back to quintessence, suppose I had some theory with a kinetic to a simple scalar field with a mass and a self-coupling. And I need that mass to be of order, let's say, the inverse Hubble scale, which is what I would need for a quintessence model, for example. Then unless your theory has a special symmetry as you take the mass to zero, then quantum corrections will drive it up to the cutoff of your theory, lambda squared. Loops of phi will renormalize the mass. And the problem now will be that the small mass that you needed will no longer remain small. And so this is what's called the challenge of technical naturalness. Not only do you need small couplings in your theory, those small couplings need to be stable against quantum mechanical corrections. And now here's a much bigger problem. And say, Anton, you asked me a question many slides ago about W less than minus one, and I'll mention that here. A problem that arises in many models that you write down is that they need to be ghost free. So this is a question that really is about the kinetic terms in your Lagrangian. The kinetic terms in Lagrangian tell you around a given background whether the particles that are associated with the theory carry positive energy or negative energy, okay? So remember the kinetic terms. Here I've written down an example. I've got a theory that has two fields and I've just written down a representative coupling that could happen. So I've got a function, there should be a phi here, I apologize for that. You've got a function of the kinetic term for phi, and it's coupled to some function of another field chi. Now imagine I expand this out around some background behavior, it depends on space and time. Then this function will get some background behavior and I'll be able to expand it out. And the kinetic terms for phi will look like this. I'll have a big F, some function of space and time in front of phi dot squared, and some other function in principle in front of grad phi squared. And it's this thing here, this F, that sets the sign of the kinetic energy right, one half phi dot squared. The sign of that is set by uh, the sign of this term f. But suppose that the evolution of my background involves this f going negative. Then the excitations associated with the free old chi have a negative kinetic energy. And if that happens, we say that the theory has ghosts. And in particular, Sayantan, almost any idea to write down a Lagrangian in which w is less than minus one, theoretically encounters this problem, that it hits W less than minus one because it has ghosts. And ghosts in general are catastrophic. If you take them seriously, they have negative energy. That means that ordinary particles can delay decay into heavier particles plus ghosts. And so this has been, or if you like, the vacuum itself can just spontaneously fragment into positive energy particles and negative energy particles. So the vacuum itself cannot be stable. And so this has been explored by many authors, by myself and, my, and Sean Carroll and Mark Hoffman and by Klein, Gion, and Moore, and many, many others. Ghosts are typically catastrophic for your theory. So if you write down a theory that has ghosts because you want it to do something attract, that you think is attractive for the data, for example, getting W less than minus one, the theory is more often than not nonsensical from the beginning. So let me give you an example of this because I think it's very important. 
The most obvious place this happens is sometimes when you have uncontrolled higher derivatives in your theorem. So here's a weird theory. It's a theory of one, one field. It's got a kinetic term, a regular kinetic term. It's got a regular potential and it has self interactions that are box five, psi squared, a very odd self interaction. And notice that crucially it has higher derivatives. This is d d phi psi squared in it. And because this is a higher order term, it has mass dimension bigger than four. I have to have a couple of orders of the cutoff to make it have the right number of dimensions. Okay. So the way to understand this theory is to introduce an auxiliary field. So the way you do it is you write a new field chi. You, so imagine you have a Lagrangian that looks like this, which looks nothing like the Lagrangian I wrote down at first, but you'll see in a minute, I've, I've chosen this carefully because this field chi here that I've introduced has no dynamics, right? So I can just write its equation of motion and integrate it up. The equation of motion is chi is box psi over that. And if I plug this back into this equation, I will recover this. So this is an equivalent theory to this, at least classically. But it's kind of nice because now I can make a field redefinition. Psi is phi minus chi and do a quick integration by parts in the action. And when I do that, I get this equation. So this theory here is equivalent to this higher derivative looking theory. And there's two things to notice that are crucial about this action. One is, if you look at this original Lagrangian, you might have thought there's only one field, psi, therefore there's only one degree of freedom. You see here, this is an equivalent action. It has two degrees of freedom. And what that tells you is that secretly in introducing higher derivatives, you introduced a new degree of freedom into this theory. And secondly, and much worse, this extra degree of freedom has a different sign to its kinetic term than the one you started with. And that is a real problem because that means that this degree of freedom is a ghost. It has a mass, the mass is at the cutoff of the theory. So it's possible that this ghost is not excited until you lose control of the theory, but that's not always true in theories. And so this simple example here where I have I higher derivatives and when I analyze the theory carefully, I see that it has an extra degree of freedom that is a ghost is a simple example of the reason why within general relativity, almost all attempts to get a sensible model of W less than minus one have failed. Sayantan, does that answer your question from earlier? Perfectly. Good. Now, other things can go wrong in your theory. Suppose that you make sure you don't have ghosts because they're so terribly behaved. What other things can go wrong? Well, one thing that can go wrong is superluminality. If you write down a Lorentz invariant quantum field theory, Lorentz invariant quantum field theories, regardless of anything else I tell you about the theory, obey microcausality. That means that the commutator of two local operators vanishes to space like separated points as an operator statement. In other words, if I take two operators in the theory, I commute, compute their commutator for points X and Y that are outside of each other's light cone, then the commutator vanishes. This is what's called microcausality. And that's fine, but it turns out that if you have superluminality, and sometimes you can have a well-behaved theory, even if causality is okay. So to show that, let me give you another example. Here's a scalar field, perfectly fine kinetic term, but I've let it have two types of self-interactions. One is d phi to the fourth. So this is still a first derivative term, but just to a higher power. And one involves d squared phi. And actually this term is the first time you're going to see a term that I'm gonna use many times in this talk called the, Gal the cubic Galileo term. So this looks like a, a fairly innocuous theory. But again, if I expand this theory about a background, so I take phi, I expand around some background phi bar and look at fluctuations then you'll see that the fluctuations, little curly phi, have a function in front of them that can be written as what I call an effective metric. And that effective metric can depend on space time. It can depend on the background value of the field, derivatives of the background value of the field, second derivatives of the background value of the field, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, I have a very complicated a tensor here that depends on a very complicated set of background values in front of the kinetic term 
for these fluctuations. And now there's an important thing. If this tensor G is globally hyperbolic, by which I mean it has some form of future light cone, then the theory described by this Lagrangian can nevertheless be perfectly causal, but it may have directions in which perturbations propagate outside of the light cone you use to define this theory. In other words, the theory can have two light cones, one defined by speed of light and one defined by this background effective metric. And you might worry that that would be a problem for your theory because maybe you can excite particles of, phi, of little phi, make them propagate outside the light cone and then make them come back inside later and for example, construct closed time-like curves and things like that, thereby ruining causality. And it turns out that that's hard to do within the, the regime of validity of this effective field theory. So it can be that you can have, if you like, things that look a-causal in your theory, but you cannot use that a-causality to do anything and remain within the regime of validity of the effective theory. And so this is something to worry about in these theories, but maybe not as bad as the ghosts. Even if these things are okay, there can be worries much worse than, that are much more complicated than these. And I won't go into horrible detail about these things, but this is a little bit for the experts in the audience. Um, it can be when you start playing with these effective field theories, these exotic explanations for example, cosmic acceleration, that the theory might not even have a Lagrange invariant UV completion. And one way to see this is from simple low energy theories by looking at their two to two scattering amplitudes. So in the previous slide, I gave you an example of, let me just go back a slide. I want to show you this again. One way to think about this Lagrangian here is that I have this particle phi and it's scattering off a bunch of background fields here. So I think about its interactions, the scattering off background fields. And so if I focus on four point amplitudes of the theory expressed as functions of the Mandelstam variables, then I won't do go into details here at all about this. This is just sketched for your amusement. Is that you can show using some, the analyticity of scattering amplitudes and a little complex analysis gymnastics and the optical theorem, that second derivatives of this function evaluated- so, Mark, is yep. this uh, four point amplitude is in the flat background? Uh, I'm using it in a flat background, but more, so that's a good question. Okay, so I would say that, I would imagine doing this in a region of space time where I don't need to worry about space time curvature. And so yes, it's fine to think about a flat background. However, in order to strictly do something like this, you need to identify asymptotic states in the quantum field theory. And there you might worry about doing this in some backgrounds, in particular backgrounds with horizons. Yeah. So that's something to worry about here, I agree. Okay. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question, Santa? Yes, yes. So anyway, there's just a simple calculation you can do to show that if you take this function, you look at it uh, at t goes to zero and you look at it in the forward limit, s to zero, then you can just show that this has to be positive. This is just math, okay? So in the forward limit, these four point scattering amplitude must have a positive S squared part of the theory. This is just a mathematical fact that's true of any Lorentz invariant theory that's described by an S matrix. So if you violate this, then it implies that you violated Lorentz invariance in the theory, for example. Let me ignore this for a minute. So here's a toy example. Suppose I give you a very simple looking theory. It's got a, it's a scalar field with a kinetic term that's perfectly well behaved. And all I've done is had added in just one derivative. So there'll be no new degrees of freedom here, no ghosts, but I've got a higher derivative interaction, V phi to the four. I can compute the two to two scattering amplitude in this theory. It's not difficult, but I, I won't do it in real time. And it takes the following form in terms of the Mandelstam variables. And now I will literally take T to zero, as I told you on the last slide, I will take two S derivatives and then I'll take S to zero. So the forward limit is T equals zero. That gives me this. And then you can see that if I take the second derivative of that with respect to S, A, the second derivative of the scattering amplitude depends only on alpha. And so remarkably, I've handed you a low energy effective field theory 
told you nothing about the ultraviolet. You're supposed to be able to ignore the ultraviolet in effective field theory. And yet you're not free to choose alpha negative in this theory. Because if you do, then you will you know that in the ultraviolet, you cannot have a Lorentz invariant theory with an analytic S matrix. So this is this is an example of a place where some of the mathematical constraints from the ultraviolet can impact your low energy effective field theories. And it's something to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? I'm about to use the EFT to tell us something different. So this would be a good point if someone has questions about what I've just said to ask. Okay. So the EFT can tell us something else about the theory. Do you remember when I talked in general about modifying gravity? I told you there were kind of two types of problem, right? One is all the theoretical problems, ghosts and things like that, that ruled out higher order curvature events. Another one it was that I told you that, for example, take F of R theories, that they didn't have ghosts, but nevertheless, they ran into problems in the solar system. So in this part of the talk, I want to address those kinds of problems, the kind of local gravity tests that arise when you're looking at dark energy models. And again, I'll work from the effective field theory because that allows me to answer the question for any kind of model, modified gravity, scalar fields, whatever you have. So here's the general theory of a scalar field conformally coupled to matter. So scalar field has a kinetic term. I've written down some general function of phi and b phi and whatever in front of it. It's got a potential and it's got a general coupling to the rest of the matter in the universe, which I've written as the trace of the energy momentum tensor, because this is the lowest order interaction you can have. And all I'm going to do now is specialize to a point source. So the question I'm going to ask is, what is the effect of this scalar field on the rest of the matter in the universe around some central mass? So let's say our point source is a central mass. Let's think of the sun, for example, or the earth. Then the trace of the energy tensor is just a point mass. It looks like this. It's localized at the origin for us. I'll call the solution, the background solution around that point mass phi bar, and I will expand out around it. If I do that, the equation of motion for fluctuations phi always takes this term, this form. It has phi double dot. It has something that I'll call the speed of sound squared that depends on the background value of phi. It has some general function of phi, the background. It has a general background dependent mass for phi and this term here. And so now you can ask, what is the behavior of these fluctuations phi around this point source by solving this slightly complicated wave equation with the source? And we're not gonna actually solve it. We're gonna just notice some general features. If I expect that the background value of these fields, phi bar, for example, are set by other quantities like the density or the local Newtonian potential or something like that, and I neglect spatial variation over the scales of interest, then the static potential felt by test particles due to this new field phi is the following. It's some complicated function of the sound speed and this function and the coupling G and some Yukawa-like exponential suppression. One over R appears here and the mass appears. So notice that if I have a very light scalar, in other words, the mass of my scalar is unbelievably small, then I can ignore this term entirely. This is some constant and this potential looks like one over R. And you would expect that to be true. If I had a massless scalar, then it should, it should mediate a Coulomb force in the same way that any other massless field does. And in this case, it would. It would have some constant up front and a one over all behavior. The problem with that is that gravity itself is extremely well tested in the solar system. So if I have a light scalar of the kind I typically need for dark energy, for cosmic acceleration, then I will have order one corrections to the gravitational force between test masses within the solar system. And that is of course ruled out even by simple tests on the earth, but it's also ruled out to exquisite precision by for example, uh, Shapiro time delay measurements from the Cassini satellite. 
Cassini mission. So if you want a workable model of dark energy, by workable, I mean one that is experimentally viable, that has a very low mass, and this applies to quintessence models, F of R models of modified gravity, and in fact, any other model of modified gravity, then you need to find a way to allow that modification to be fully operative on cosmological scales so that you change the cosmological evolution to make it accelerate and be essentially invisible on the scale of the solar system. You need to get rid of it on the scales of the solar system. And the general mechanism for doing that we call screening mechanisms. So what I've tried to present on this slide is an argument, a loose argument based on effective field theory, that if you want to have a field coming from modified gravity or coming from a, a, a quintessence model or some other form of dark energy, typically you're going to have to find a way to screen that the effects of that field within the solar system. In fact, it also applies on galactic scales as well, but let's focus on the solar system for now. So how can you, what, what are these screening mechanisms? They sound very mysterious. Well, we go back to the effective field theory classification I used in my uh, earlier comments. Remember the EFT classifications of fields in a covariant Lagrangian. You can have kinetic terms, self-couplings, or couplings between fields. And depending on which part of Lagrangian you use for a screening mechanism, the mechanism gets different names. You can have the Einstein mechanism, where you use the kinetic terms to make the coupling to matter weaker. I'm going to show you that explicitly. You can have the chameleon mechanism, where you use a coupling to matter to give your scalar a large mass in the solar system and therefore make it invisible. Or you can use couplings between the theories to give the scalar a small vacuum if, uh, expectation value in regions of low density, lowering the coupling to matter. And I won't talk about this in any detail. I'll mostly focus on the Weinstein mechanism, but I will mention the chameleon mechanism too. So what's the chameleon mechanism? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because of, 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 uh, of time really, but um, in fact, you know, I think I'm not going to talk about the chameleon mechanism. I'm gonna move on. So I can talk about it in questions if you come up to me. So, I wanted to talk about the Weinstein mechanism. And before I talk about the Weinstein mechanism, I'm going to take a small detour to mention massive gravity. The reason I want to do that is that massive gravity is very complicated. And it'll turn out the easiest way to study massive gravity is to start study a proxy for it known as Galileans, which, can, which are a limit of massive gravity. And Galileans, it will turns out, will be the perfect place for me to give you an example of, of the Weinstein screen. So let me introduce this type of field and we'll come back to the Weinstein screen and I'll show you how it so massive gravity is a much more radical way to think about modifying gravity than the ways I've mentioned so far. Rather than saying I can have a different action for the metric, massive gravity says, what if the graviton itself has a mass? And this notion itself is pretty alluring in the sense that you know that in general, if you have a field that is massless, it will mediate Coulomb forces and therefore have long range effects, say in the solar system. But once you give something a mass, typically you can arrange, that will mean that it's, it's forces mediated by it are of the Yukawa form. And therefore they will not be, if you give it a big enough mass, they'll not be effective on short scales. And so having a massive graviton seems like it might be a way to have your cake and eat it. You could have this be important on large scales and have it naturally not be important on small scales. And we'll see that that's both true and false. So the first people who suggested that you might be able to have a massive graviton were Fiat and Pauli, and they showed how in linearized gravity you can do this. What they do is they write down g mu nu is some background g mu nu plus h mu nu, which is the graviton. And they showed that if you're very clever, if you write down a mass term that is a combination of the trace of the graviton and the square of the graviton, then if you use that mass term, there are no ghosts in the linearized theory. So that's already nice. You would think that by introducing a mass, you might risk having an extra degree of freedom and that degree of freedom could be a ghost. But in fact, if you make this special mass term, Fiat's poly term, you don't have ghosts. However, it was quickly realized, in fact, proven in the 1970s by Bulwer and Dezer, that if you try to take a theory like this, which is just linearized, right? This is just at the quadratic level. You try to make it effective, you know, a fully covariant, if you like, version of this with higher order uh, uh, terms inter of interaction, 
then there will be no way to avoid having a ghost in the theory. And I've tried to convey to you that ghosts really are catastrophic. And so it was thought from the 1970s onwards that having a theory of massive gravity that really was the theory was not possible, that all nonlinear completions would have this so-called Bulwer Desert Ghost. It's been realized in the last decade or so that this is not quite correct. Uh, and so there's a set of theories of gravity discovered uh, initially by uh, Dharam Gavdadze and Tolley that uh, involve, I've written down here, Einstein Hilbert, matter and something that looks an awful lot like a potential for the graviton, which is what you might think you need to give it a mass. But I've got this extra thing in here that's some sort of fictitious object, fictitious metric. And I won't go into the details of massive gravity at all. I just want to say that it's not obvious at all how to construct a ghost-free theory of massive gravity and allowing to introducing an object that is not really a dynamical degree of freedom in the theory, but is uh, a mathematical trick, this fictitious metric, it turns out to allow you a powerful way to write down theories like this. So and, uh, Mark, yes, if is like kind of a metric or something like that? It is a metric, but it's not a dynamical metric. Okay, so is, is this kind of theory is called bi-gravity theory or something like that? No, so it's a good question. So the theory as I've written it here is absolutely not by gravity. It contains a, sim a single massive graviton. Okay. Uh, and F is just, you can think of it as being a mathematical trick to enable me to find the very clever terms that are allowed to give uh, a sort of covariant completion of the Fields Pauli action. But if I were to go further and make this F dynamical, then I would have a bigravity theory. But I won't talk about bigravity here. Okay. okay. So it's been proven now, in fact, it's been known for, for almost 10 years now that this theory, this class of theories are ghost free and people have been working very hard on their cosmology, acceleration, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and in fact, it was, reason, it was realized relatively early by Hassan and Rosen that there are uh, sort of more simple ways to see that theories like this are ghost free and that is by using the field line formalism. And so I just say that so that people know that it's not impossible to come up with theories like this. There are actually clever tricks that allow you to uh, not to have to do all the really hard work. Now, I won't talk about massive gravity in technical detail because it's an you know, entire set of lectures on its own. But it turns out that a limit of massive gravity, you take a particular limit, is a scalar field. And it's a very clever kind of scalar field. And it's a scalar field that has arisen in other contexts uh, where people have thought about modifying gravity pool, for example, the like Gabbadadze Parati model. And it turns out that many of the, the salient features of massive gravity that I care about in this talk are also displayed by, um, uh, by, Gal by these scalar fields. And so for us, it'll be good enough. So I'm going to focus on this scalar field and I'm going to talk about a class of scalar fields that have become widely studied, known as Galileo. So now I want to imagine that we have a scalar field, I'll call it pi, and that pi has the following symmetry. And this symmetry you can show arises from massive gravity in a limit, but for us, we will just abstract it and think about it in an effective field theory context. It's got a shift symmetry, pi goes to pi plus a shift, but it's also got this weird behavior, pi goes to pi plus b mu x mu. And a way to think about that is that if you differentiated this expression, you would get d mu pi goes to d mu pi, this would go away, plus d mu. And so what you have is a field that has a shift symmetry and also a shift symmetry in its derivative. And if we abstract the field in such a way, uh, forgetting about its origin, then the field is called the Galileon. This is called the Galilean symmetry. And it was first uh, discussed in this way by Nicolas Rattazzi and Trukin back in 2009. Now, you can write down a lot of different terms that have this symmetry. In particular, any term you write down that looks like two derivatives of pi to any power will satisfy the symmetry. Well, Mark, I, I just have a question here. So when you have implemented this Galilean symmetry, uh, what is uh, exactly uh, in your mind? What do you exactly want to do here? Why particularly you want to use this kind of symmetry here? 
Well, I, I'm not pulling this out of thin air. I'm claiming that this is the field that arises as a limit of massive gravity, and it has this symmetry. Okay, okay, okay. And so this symmetry comes from massive gravity. It turns out that it also comes from the DGP model in a particular limit, too. Okay, okay. So I'm going to use these as a proxy for massive gravity. Many of the features of massive gravity that are interesting for what I'm talking about here are also true of the Galileos. Now, wh why particularly I have asked, so there is uh, some another uh, context people like for inflation, people have written some effective field theory by Paolo Gremelini and others. They have written and they have introduced something called uh, like Stuckelberg trick. So that, uh, yeah. Yeah, so is, is it kind of similar type of mechanism? Yeah, the way the scalar arises is by using the Stokelberg trick on massive gravity. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's why I want to ask this question. So, so technically speaking, what you do is you use the Stokelberg trick and then, then you have to, uh, find a way to diagonalize the kinetic terms for the scalar that arises and the metric. And when you do that trick, this is the field that pops out. Yeah, exactly. OK. Thank you. Sure. So, so what does this scale field look like? Well, I told you there's an infinite number of terms I can write down where I just have two derivatives acting on pi to any power. That trivially satisfies this symmetry because the first derivative kills this and the second derivative kills this. That's not very interesting. What's interesting are these terms. So in, in, in uh, D dimensions, you can have in, uh, N plus in, one term. In n dimensions, you can have n plus one terms. In four dimensions, you can have five terms. And in four dimensions, these are the terms you can have. You can have pi. You can have the kinetic term. You can have this term that I introduced earlier. Now I'm going to call the cubic Galileo. And two more terms that I'm not going to write down for now. And I'm going to tell you some things, more things about these theories. So first of all, these theories have a separation of scales. This is a remarkable fact. I'm going to show you more about it in a minute. It allows for classical field configurations with order one nonlinearities, but nevertheless in which quantum effects are under control. That's not true in most theories, and I'll emphasize that in a moment. So that allows you to study nonlinear classical solutions. And one very important nonlinear classical solution will be the thing that exhibits this thing I've called Einstein screening. So I'm not, I haven't forgotten about that. I'm coming back to it. Now, we now understand, by the way, just parenthetically, that there are many variations on this theme that share the same properties as this simple theory. And you can get at them in many ways through probe-brain constructions, cosec constructions. And you can read about those in, in that review article I, I gave you earlier. Um, and I won't uh, dwell on them here. But there are many different theories that share these, these properties. But let me be more specific about Galileans. They take this term in n plus 1 dimensions, where so the n plus one Galilean term has some complicated tensor structure that just has some symmetries. And then the thing you really care about is that they have a single derivative, a single derivative, and then a bunch of second derivatives. And then this structure here is the structure that is the clever part of this. This guarantees that you have second order equations of motion. I won't go into this general details, but this tensor has, it's anti-symmetric in the new indices, anti-symmetric in the mu indices and symmetric under the exchange of any mu nu pair. I won't be using that in detail. Only the first n of these are non-trivial in n dimensions, okay? If you try to use this construction to, in say in four dimensions to create a sixth term, you'll find that it's always the total derivative. And it turns out that there's an interesting mathematical aside here that this simple example I gave you, the single field Galilean, is what mathematicians call an Euler hierarchy. And I, I, this was pointed out to me, at least by David Fairley. So if you go back to your dynamical systems or, or, uh, ma or uh, dynamics course, and you write down a Lagrangian that just has this form. I have a single thing, x, phi, and it, L, the Lagrangian only depends on one time derivative. Then I make some equation of motion that takes this form. And from that, I make a second Lagrangian that consists of multiplying my first Lagrangian by the equation of motion. This seems like a weird thing to do, but trust me, you do it. Then I get a second equation of motion. 
And then I can now construct a third Lagrangian. And I get a third equation of motion. And then I keep doing that. Then you will find that once you get to the nth Lagrangian, you get a total derivative. You know, and for the, in the case of the Galileans, this is exactly what's going on, only in a slightly more uh, complicated way. That there are um, only n of them, and then you have total derivatives thereafter. So it's a very constrained set of operators that you have in the affected field theory. And the wonderful thing about these is that they have second order equations of motion. And that means that you don't get the ghost, the obvious ghost that you would get in the theory. And the reason that that's true for the Galileans as I presented them to you is because they came from massive gravity, which also doesn't have ghost. Okay, so I've introduced the scalar field. Now I wanna tell you about this thing called the Weinstein effect. Remember what I'm looking for here. I, I'm going to eventually want to use, say, massive gravity or a modification of gravity or the Galilean as a way to accelerate the universe. I want it to give me an order one correction to general relativity on large scales. But the problem I encounter is that I also get an order one correction to general relativity in the solar system. And I don't want that to happen. So I want something called a screening effect and the Weinstein effect is an example. So here's a very specific example of how it works using just what I call the cubic Galileo. So here's a scalar field. I've given the, the kinetic term a weird normalization. Don't worry about that. So regular kinetic term, d pi squared, coupling to all the rest of the matter in the solar system, just by coupling to the trace of the angular momentum tensor. And I've given it a Planck level coupling. And the reason I've done that is to say that I'm going to allow it to be gravitationally coupled to everything else. That's the weakest I could imagine. And now I've got a self-interaction of this weird higher derivative form. This is the cubic Galilean. So it will not have higher derivative equations of motion. Nevertheless, it does have a higher derivative in the Lagrangian. So now I'm gonna look at spherical solutions around a point mass. So I'm gonna make T be exactly the example I gave you earlier, a point mass. I'm gonna expand out pi around it. So first of all, I'll solve the background equation of motion for the background behavior of pi around this point mass, and it takes this form. And this is really an interesting form. So let's study this a little. I've defined, uh, which turns out to be a radius, which is constructed from the central mass, m, think of the sun if you like, Planck mass, and this lambda that I put in. I'm gonna call this the Weinstein radius. If I'm looking at distances much bigger than the Weinstein radius, then the profile for pi just looks like one over r. It looks like a regular massless scalar field with a point mass source, which you would expect because it is a massless scalar field with a point mass source. What's more interesting is that less than the Weinstein radius, the solution changes, it becomes this root r plus a constant behavior. That is very, very different to this Coulomb type behavior. And now I can ask the question, if I have this pi, what is the force between test masses in the, sol in the solar system around this point mass? And compare the, the force mediated by this field to the force mediated by Newtonian gravity, let's say. And so here is what it is. At large distances, this should be little r, at little r much bigger than the Weinstein radius, guess what? It's an order one correction. The sizes of order one. So as you might expect, I've introduced a new field, phi, massless, coupled with gravitational strength to all the rest of the matter. And indeed, it gives you a gravitational strength force between objects at large distances. More interestingly though, at small distances, r less than rv, the force is suppressed, it's r over rv to some power by this Feinstein radius. And that means that the forces in the solar system, for example, here are much smaller than gravitational strength, even though I have a massless field coupled with gravitational strength. And if I make my parameters of the right size, I will be completely safe from local tests, fifth force tests of gravity in the solar system, even though I have order one differences from GR at large distances. And this is what's called Weinstein screening. In fact, one can do a little more than this. You might worry how perturbations of the field now behave in the solar system. So I will take that background solution that I wrote down on the last side, call it phi zero, and perturb around the background. 
And to be consistent in perturbation theory, I'll also perturb the angular momentum tensor. And now I'll ask, what is the Lagrangian that I get for these perturbations? And I won't write down every term, just the ones I care about. There's a kinetic term. There's the Galilean interaction, as you might expect. There's the, the I should, should be I just one, one, one confusion. So like usually instead of this half, why this three factor appears? It, it's, a, it's a convenient parameterization. Just don't, it's, I used it because it's what actually arises without a redefinition of fields. I could have re redefined the field. I just have the equation to hand with this three in it. Oh, okay. But all that would happen, is everything would change by factors of order one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. but to, as I said, don't worry about that three. It's not, it's, it's, it would be better if I'd written a half, but it's not introducing any new physics that I'm lying to you about in the equation. Sure, sure. Um, so it's got the kinetic term, it's got the Galilean self-interaction with the same cutoff, and it's got, this should say M Planck, it's got a Planck scale coupling, a gravitational strength coupling between phi and this perturbation. But now look at the kinetic, there's this extra kinetic contribution here, and evaluate it on the background solution. And I know the background solution. I wrote it down on the, in the last slide. So I can tell you what that looks like. And that whole contribution looks like RB over R to some power. And so now you think of this as multiplying E to mu nu if you like. And so now look what happens. I have a kinetic term here, but I also have a kinetic term here with a term in front of it. And furthermore, in the solar system, R is much less than RB. And so what I have is a massive, really big contribution to the kinetic term here in the solar system. And so if I canonically normalize the scalar field phi, right, I, I write phi is, I, I, I canonically normalize by multiplying it by a big number. Then what will happen is that if the effect of that, the way to think about this simply is just to take this big number I've got in front of the kinetic term and divide through by it. Then the effective strong coupling scale becomes huge and the effective coupling becomes very small, much higher than the Planck scale. In other words, not only do I not get fifth force constraints in the solar system, but matter moving around in the solar system just will not excite the scalar field because the coupling is much weaker than gravity in the solar system. So the Weinstein effect is kind of miraculous. It means that if you have a theory like this, you can have an order one correction to GR on cosmological scales and be completely safe in the solar system from any local tests of gravity. It's very powerful. To explain this in a little bit more schematic, uh, a little more schematically, but also a little bit more detailed, just think about what's going on here. Here's my point mass, and here's distance away from the origin. If I had handed you a regular old quantum field theory, it would have had two regimes that would be interesting to you. One would be the extreme ultraviolet, okay? The usual quantum regime of the theory. Scales much less than one over the cutoff. Um, any, if you like, the classical coupling, the size of classical nonlinearity is very big, and the scale of quantum effects, very, the scale of quantum effects very big as well. In other words, the usual story of an effective field theory. In the ultraviolet, you don't know what predictions are. There would also be another region of the theory, the far infrared. You would be much bigger than, you're at very large distances. All classical effects will be small and all quantum effects will be small. This is the usual perturbative linear classical regime of a theory. We know how to deal with it there. We know how to do perturbative quantum field theory there. We know how to trust the theory there. What's amazing about theories like the Galileans and massive gravity and things like that is that there is in these theories an, another regime, another parametrically large regime between the Weinstein scale and one over the cutoff where you can have quantum effects be still much less than one, completely under control, and yet classical nonlinearities can be large. And that means that you can have interesting effects like the Weinstein screening in a regime where you completely trust the classical predictions of the theory. That makes some very unusual theories and theoretically quite attractive and complicated theories as well. One reason that this is true 
And one reason that these theories are so attractive is that they possess what's called a non-renormalization theorem. Sometimes you, you will have heard of non-renormalization theorems before. For example, supersymmetric theories have non-renormalization theories. In supersymmetric theories, the reason there are non-renormalization theorems is that you try to compute quantum corrections, say, from fermions, and you get results. But then when you compute the quantum corrections from scalars and other fields, they cancel the fermions. And so you get no renormalization. In Galileans, there's a slightly different explanation. If you can expand the quantum effective action for the classical field around an expectation value, and you compute the one point irreducible diagrams, you see that the endpoint contribution always contains two n powers of external momentum. And this just means that you can't renormalize, renormalize those terms I showed down. There's just literally no Feynman diagram you can write down that would give you a quantum correction to the, the five Galilean terms that I wrote down. And in fact, and this was realized early on by uh, various people, uh, Luti Parati Rattazzi, Nicolas Rattazzi, and, and um, uh, was shown by uh, Dan Wesley, and Kurt Hinterbeckler and, and myself the, to be true in any number of dimensions for any number of fields, that it's true. And, and then subtle aspects of this were uh, explored uh, later by myself and Gunn and Hinterbeckler and Joyce in 2016. So it's kind of a remarkable fact about these theories, they're quantum behaviors. And in fact, even better, you can add a small mass term to these theories. As long as it's small, that mass will remain technically natural. You remember back when I talked about quintessence, if we add small mass terms, you have to worry about technical naturalness, unless there's a new symmetry that arises in the limit that the mass goes to zero. And indeed here, there's a new symmetry that arises in the limit that the mass goes to zero, the Galilean symmetry, and it protects the mass. So another reason to think that these theories might be helpful in cosmology. This is a slide I will spend no time on, except to say that if there are people who are mathematically oriented, there's a very sort of cute mathematical story about these that was uh, shown in this paper I wrote with Gunn, Hinterbeckler, and Joyce in 2012, uh, that you can understand these Galileans as West Zemino terms in, of the spontaneous symmetry breaking in these models. And there's a nice mathematical story that Galileans can be thought of as in D dimensions, they are D form potentials for D plus one forms, which are non-trivial co-cycles in what's called Lie algebra cohomology of the full symmetry group. So, this is a very technical mathematical statement to make, and I'm putting it here just if you're mathematically oriented, there's a nice mathematical story to go along with this focus. Now, so far, I've only given you sort of the theory. Uh, I've said, you know, I put a central mass in, I construct a radius called a Weinstein radius from the central mass and the Planck mass and the cutoff of the theory. I haven't actually said how big the Weinstein radius is, and it turns out that the Weinstein radius is huge. So to give you an, a very concrete example, if I choose my parameters in that cubic Galilean theory I gave you to give me the best chance of having a theory that explains cosmic acceleration, for example, then the Weinstein radius of the sun is 10 to the seven astronomical units. And so not only are you safe from local tests of gravity, local meaning in the solar system, you're safe 10 to the seven times that size, roughly speaking. 10 to the six times. If you have a galaxy, it has, it, you know, a galaxy is of course much more mass than the sun, but it's also more uh, diffusely distributed. Uh, so the size of the Weinstein radius of a galaxy is a water of megaparsec. It's about 30 galactic radii. And for a cluster, it's about 10 megaparsecs or 10 burial radii. The story of this slide is not that you should care about the actual you know, careful numbers here, rather that the Weinstein effect is incredibly effective. It works, the screening is very, very powerful. Um, let me look at my time here. Um, yeah, I think, Sangatan, I'll just say, I think I'm going to not give the last part of my talk about early dark energy. And when I'm done with this, this uh, part, I'll stop and take the questions. I'm not close to the end yet, but that so seems to be the right answer. You want to end here? No, no, no. But I'm just saying, just for your knowledge, I won't give the last part of my talk about uh, early dark energy. That's I'll okay. Stop. That's okay. That's okay. So, what I, just to say, so I've tried to give you this picture that massive gravity is 
complicated but alluring. It's a complicated way to modify gravity, but it has some wonderful gifts such as Feinstein screening and the possibility of naturalness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it does have some problems when you apply it to cosmology, okay? For example, one thing we love in cosmology is perfect homogeneous isotropic solutions, the Freeman Robertson Walker FRW solutions. It turns out in the simplest incarnation of massive gravity, these do not exist. And you might think of that as a problem, okay? Nevertheless, you certainly can find slightly inhomogeneous cosmologies that behave just like FRW models over scales we care about. And we don't really have problems with those. And there are modifications to massive gravity that don't have this problem at all. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'll just ignore that statement, actually. Uh, so is massive gravity up to the job? Well, you know, in the last decade, people have put a huge amount of effort into trying to modify massive gravity and see whether what the range of possible theoretical models are that share its nice features and allow us to address cosmological problems. Many of these models are incredibly complicated and baroque, and I'm not trying to sell any of them to you as the correct way of doing this, but I do want to give you a feeling for the kinds of things that are being explored. So DRGT, Ghost Free Massive Gravity, was the starting point here. People tried to play with mass varying massive gravity. After all, if I can write down a complicated theory with a mass for the graviton, perhaps I can have that mass depend on other fields in the theory and hence depend on time or space. People have introduced what's called quasi dilaton massive gravity, where the scalar field behaves slightly differently. Extended quasi dilaton, -dilaton massive gravity. Galileans with massive gravity. In fact, Hinterbickler and Curie uh, uh, and uh, Gavidadze and I uh, presented a master theory that can be applied to any one of these theories. And indeed, as Sayantan asked earlier, by gravity, fully promoting this fictitious metric that I used as a mathematical trick to to identify the particular ghost-free terms that are allowed and promoting it to a dynamical second metric. The idea to get from this slide is not that these are attractive models, but rather that there are a host of theoretical directions in which one can take the studies of these theories. So far, the results are mixed. I'd say there's no definitive model in which all the calculations are under control. And there's this nice little summary article by Kurt Hinterbickler from 2017, which I think still in many ways captures the challenges uh, that models like this face. So I've spent a lot of time uh, walking you through the sort of space of theoretical approaches to cosmic acceleration, the space of theoretical challenges to those models from ghosts, superluminality, Lorentz invariant UV completions, the existing, the um, uh, technical naturalness, uh, things like, like that. And I've tried to show how in the effective field theory formulation, one can really have a sort of overarching structure in which you can think about those problems. And I've shown you how within the effective field theory structure, it tells you that you're going to need something like a screening mechanism. And I've given you some examples of screening mechanisms, particularly the Weinstein mechanism. All of that is in the realm of constraining approaches to writing down models. What happens when you get a model that you think is good? How do you go looking for it in the data? So by far the most powerful way to do this that we know is using combined data sets from different parts of cosmology. So very roughly speaking, we're trying to use the following fact. So very broadly speaking, the notion is the following. Gravity is behind the expansion history of the universe. If I hand you the gravitational theory of, that you want to use and the set of fields that you want to use in your theory, and then I ask you what happens on the very largest scales in cosmology, then you make the homogeneous isotropic time dependent ansatz and you compute background cosmology. And that's a simple thing to do in any model really, really. And that gives you background expansion of the universe. However, and, and then your challenge is to make that be accelerating, which you can do in very many models. Once you've done that, you've pinned down a lot of parameters in your model. Then the question becomes, 
Gravity does other things too. Gravity controls how matter clumps up on smaller scales. And in principle, from model to model, once you fix the background evolution, the way in which matter clumps up can be different from model to model, subtly different in some cases. And we have remarkable data. We have data from very, very large scales, roughly speaking, the cosmic microwave background, very early times, large scales. That tells us some things about the way in which density fluctuations are on large scales. We have many, many other measurements. This is just a small number I've put on here, cluster abundances, a galaxy structure of galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and its uh, uh, descendants. Gravitational lensing measurements that show us the structure, the topographic, the, 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 stru the tomographical structure of structure formation and even the clumping of intergalactic hydrogen on small scales. All of these providers with independent, well, maybe not quite independent, but tests on very different scales of how gravity has caused matter to clump up. And what I've plotted through them here in uh, Cyan is the matter power spectrum that is the best fit to these models. And the hope is that as we do better and better and better with cross relating these possible explanations for cosmic acceleration, distinguish a cosmological constant from dark energy, from different modified gravities, from massive gravity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have an idea, this is where, and it can pass all the theoretical tests I've talked about, this is where it'll, uh, it'll really uh, meet its test. Okay. So in a little bit more detail, I'll just say that the way you do this is by writing down a perturbed metric in cosmological perturbation theory. Assume that you've got the correct cosmic expansion here in history. And then in general relativity, there is a very tight relationship between this function here, psi, and this function phi, namely, they're equal. And also this function phi obeys the Poisson equation in general relativity. But if you have any modified gravity approach, then typically, not always, but typically, those two potentials are not equal. And also the Poisson equation is not equal. And this has been, this is a very old, old loop group of references here. One can do much better than this these days, but many people have thought about this. And since I wrote this slide, many more people have thought about it. So when you confront data, uh, for example, in F of R theories, you can see that there are differences between the data. And I'm not going to stick to the slide because I don't want to go into the detail. I want to instead go to the solar system test that I mentioned before. So in the context of the PPN formalism in gravity, solar system tests confirm general relativity to one part in 10 to the four. What does that mean? Well, in the solar system, you can perturb the metric in this way. You can write down Newtonian potential, corrections, higher order corrections in the Newtonian potential, and corrections here. Notice that, well, notice that this is a higher order correction. And that if I didn't have this, then these two terms would differ only by this parameter gamma. So gamma tells me how different these two terms are. And beta tells me whether there's a higher order correction. These two terms can both affect, for example, the precession of orbits in the solar system. And that term gamma also affects the propagation of light, but not beta. In scalar tensor theories, just to give you an example, so this encapsulates all quintessence theories, all simple uh, modifications of gravity like F of R theories, you often find terms that look like this. The metric when expanded looks like this. And you see that you've got modifications that appear in here. In principle, these measurements can provide stringent tests of new forces of gravitational strength. On top of all these tests, I should say, sorry, I should have said, stringent tests along the lines of the kind that I mentioned in previous slides. And so if you want to avoid these tests, you can introduce a screening mechanism. The screening mechanisms allow you to evade tests like this. For example, the Weinstein mechanism allows you to do that. But in Weinstein theories, it turns out that then you can have new lensing phenomena. So Mark Wyman in particular, who lent me this slide, uh, has shown that in Weinstein, simple Weinstein screen theories, you end up with corrections of this form, which means that the lensing potential felt by 
light as it moves through the solar system is modified. So this is an example where you're being lensed by say clusters and the cluster or even in the solar system is, has caused the light to bend around it. The bending is modified compared to that in general relativity and that can in principle be measured. And in recent years, uh, so for example, uh, the, you see, let's just focus on, on here. You're the, what you're seeing here is the shear, uh, change in the, the shear of uh, images due to lensing compared to that in general relativity. And you see that it can get all the way up to 5% depending on the kind of model you're using. Okay. And so, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I won't explain further in this slide. So you can see modifications compared to GR, modifications can get more severe depending on how big the difference the Weinstein screen, the Weinstein effect is. In recent years, uh, in work with um, Tessa Baker, Joseph Klampitz, and Bubish Jane, we've shown that you can use voice even as a test of, of uh, Galilean gravity. So here we've used the fact that there are parts of the solar system that are very empty. And you remember the Weinstein effect depends on a big central mass to screen things. So you might think that a good place to look for deviations is where there's no mass. And then you would expect all to one corrections to GR again. And of course, you don't really get a place with no mass, but voids have much reduced mass. And here you're seeing how much less mass in a void there are. These are void profiles where you've got the cosmological density here and less mass inside a void for different models. And you can solve um, for the lensing profile here. And again, you can see changes compared to gravity. So here we're fitting uh, compared using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, seven number seven data release. And the general notion here is, because I don't want to go into the numbers in great detail, are that voids appear shallower in gravitation, in Galilean gravity, than in GR. So again, a possible test of these theories using the fact that they have screening mechanisms. In general, I would like to make since I've been using effective field theory all along, an analogy with particle physics for models like this. If you think in the language of a particle physicist, new to physics, if you want to discover new physics, it relies on the following things. You can either increase the energy of your collisions at a collider, that allows you to access new events that don't appear at lower energies, or you can increase the luminosity of your accelerator, for example, more Higgs particles, and therefore they measure, the, measure their decay modes more accurately. And that allows you not to get to new energies, but it allows you to discover things that are very rare because now you have better statistics. And that allows you to discover new physics via virtual uh, uh, loops. Doing survey cosmology of the kind I just described is analogous to this. If you want to discover new physics, you can increase the redshift of detection to get new, effect, new events. In other words, new objects that you literally see because you can see further away in the past, if you like, than you did with other uh, surveys, or you can increase the number of objects you detect, increase your statistics, look at more of the sky, make more precise measurements. And in our case, I'm thinking specifically of more precise measurements of inhomogeneities. And that allows you to look for different signatures in the shape of the power spectrum that you can discover at a statistically significant level. And all of these things are important. And all of these allow access to a lot of new physics. And if you want some, not uh, some sort of descriptions generally about how this can work for the next generation of survey cosmology. Uh, I was part of a white paper for the US Department of Energy that I wrote with Scott Donaldson and Catherine Heidman and Chris Harata and Klaus Honchid and Aaron Rubin and Rush Saljak and Anze Slojar. Uh, and you can read that here on the left. Now, probably the last thing I'll say about observation is the following. If I was giving this talk several years ago, I would have stopped just there. But now we have new tools, okay? LIGO, Virgo, and, and the Dark Energy Survey together are already bounding many of the ideas I talked about in this talk through a completely other way of measuring gravity, namely through gravitational waves. And theory space has already begun to get narrower and it might get much more narrower. To give a specific example, with a single event, gravitational wave 170817 and the observation of its optical counterpart, GRB 170817A, huge regions of modified gravity space and related theory space were completely ruled out as solutions for cosmic acceleration. 
And this is really a remarkable step forward. And so as we measure more events, these constraints are gonna get tighter and either we're gonna see a spectacular discovery that we have some deviation from GR that might be able to explain some of the cosmological observations or we are going to rule out many of the ideas that I talked about in this talk. For example, if you look at, a, at any number of development papers, I've just quoted one here from my, my colleagues, the landscape of just scalar tensor theories seem to be summarized along the pro probable, sorry, the landscape of scalar tensor theories seems to be summarizable in the following way. If I have a Lagrangian or a scale field phi, I'll write its kinetic term in this way, that takes the following general form, then that's gonna be okay. Although this G3 term already is running into some trouble with cosmological observations. But if you include any higher terms, for example, G4 terms, I'm using here the, the name for these terms that is, comes from the general Pondesky classification of models, then these are gonna be all ruled out as explanations for accelerating universe. So there are small parameter tunings you can do, initial conditions games you can play. You have a small subset of models that are still viable. But that one observation, a single event, ruled out a lot of the models that people were interested in. Very powerful. So these theories are difficult. We're laying out criteria here that must be satisfied by the theories and others, but no currently entirely satisfactory understanding of acceleration exists in the control regime. There's a lot more work needed. I've tried to show you that screening, particularly Feinstein screening is useful and a very powerful effect. And in fact, much better than needed to recover local tests of gravity. But its behavior around different sources is wholly understood. And there's a lot of work to do here. And I've shown you in particular that, for example, lensing can be a way to get at the screening effect. You might worry about certain theoretical issues here, sensible UV behavior, for example, in these models. And there's a lot of work remains to be done, I think, to understand whether that's a feature or a bug. And what I mean by that statement is, suppose that you can show that you have a compelling theory that fits the data very well, but which does not have a Lorentz invariant UV completion. It could be that that's telling you that there need to be Lorentz invariant UV completions for the theory. And people have begun to think about those ideas. I'm not selling them to you, but it's important to know where you should have an open mind. And it's important to say that these ideas might ultimately fail or require some new uh, understandings of UV behavior. So let me summarize. Uh, I try to point out that cosmic acceleration in particular is one of our deepest problems, but it's also one in which we're in a very lucky situation. Data is flooding in and will continue to flood in. The theoretical side of cosmic acceleration faces very serious questions posed not only by the data, even, which is true even if a cosmological constant is the right answer. And a lot of theorists are hard at work on this using insights from cosmology, gravitation, and particle physics. And in my opinion, I actually think we're still quite far away from a solution, despite many of the interesting ideas that I've been putting forward today. If I could get one thing across to young people interested in working on this is that a lot of ideas being ruled out are tightly constrained by either measurements from surveys or LIGO or from theoretical concerns. But that shouldn't turn you off trying to have new theoretical ideas. What you should keep in mind is that you, can't, you can no longer get away with writing down just some simple perfect fluid. You need to have a theory which is theoretically has a mass theoretical questions about and answer theoretical questions about. Otherwise, you're just really reparameterizing the data. So serious models only need to apply, okay? Theoretical consistency is a crucial question. You gotta ask the right question, be able to ask the right questions and thoroughly investigate the answers. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your contribution. And uh, there are a few questions in the chat box, I want to address it uh, first. And uh, then if somebody wants to ask some question, then we can discuss about that. So the last question uh, is about, is it possible to detect presence of field variations in solar system while any asteroid or comet passes? By deploying sensors across various points within solar system. 
Um, I think it depends on the theory. Um, I mean, you're asking a general, this is not about cosmic acceleration. This is just asking, uh, can you detect, if you like, perturbations of the metric due to an asteroid? Yeah, yeah. Is that the question? So I must say I've never, so that's, that's a question that's a little bit outside the scope of the talk, which is fine, of course. Um, I would say, let me, let me stop sharing for a moment so I can see better what's going on. Um, uh, all right, let me, let me make sure I have my talk where I need it. Um, sorry, my talk just closed. I want to reopen it. Oh, I see. There we go. Um, so I would say that, um, I, for me at least, it's hard to imagine that the size of the perturbations to gravity given by an asteroid is going to perturb the metric in such a way that we can measure those, this, those differences. But I've never really given a thought to the actual size of those effects. So I'm probably not the right person to ask on the fly like this what the answer is to that question. So uh, thank you. Uh, next question is, could string theory define the concept of gravitons also? And string theory does define it. I mean, if string theory is correct, we, we understand what gravitons are. I mean, in, in the low energy effective theory, gravitons are the quantized perturbations of the spin two perturbations of the metric. In, in, in string theory, they, uh, in that limit, they are also what I just said, but in fact, they are uh, uh, given by um, oscillations of, uh, you know, quantized oscillations of a closed string in string theory. So string theory does define gravitons very unambiguously. The difficult question is, Next. that doesn't help um, talk about, but it is true that they are very cleanly defined in string theory. Yeah, thank you. Next question is, could the host particles, neutrinos be the candidate of dark matter? Why they're calling it host particles, neutrinos? I don't know. So, yeah, so let me, let me try to separate out the words in that sentence. I think what the person is saying is sometimes people have referred to neutrinos as ghostly particles in the past, by which they just mean they're very hard to detect. And if that's what you meant, then we're just talking about neutrinos, and I'll answer you. I think in that. But before I do that, let me say that if you meant, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Continue. If you meant, if you meant, could neutrinos be ghosts? The answer is no. Ghosts are very bad. Like that. Um, neutrinos, we do not think are going to be the dark matter, and there are a couple. Certainly, the neutrinos of the standard model, and the reason is that the neutrinos of this. If you know, one thing you can do. Um, to measure the amount of regular matter in the universe is you can, you can use nuclear synthesis. And that is a very tight bound on the total energy density, if you like, if you like in, in standard model particles. That is far below the amount in, in dark matter. So dark matter should not be something from the standard model for that reason and any number of other reasons. Now, could I have something else that behaves like a neutrino but is higher mass and you know, some sort of sterile version of a neutrino. Maybe people do talk about that, but um, but there are constraints on that for sure. Yeah. So his next question is: but, Could sterile new neutrinos be the candidate? <laughs> I mean, people do talk about that in principle, yes. But it, the, of course, the devil is in the details. It depends what you mean by a sterile neutrino, right? To call it an actual sterile neutrino, it has to fit into a particle physics model that, that you can then ask questions about its mass and its interaction with other fields and where you would have seen them and where you wouldn't have seen them. So I think my loose answer is maybe, uh, but it will all depend on the details. And that, that really is true of most suggestions. Yeah. Next question is, field for inflation also included in Lagrangian and cosmic late time acceleration also expressed as fields in Lagrangian. So what exactly distinguishes while expressing them in equations? I think I understand the question. I think, I think you're saying 
well, they tell you that I want to write down a model that explains inflation and docking. And yeah, I, I, I tell you that I'm going to have two it. fields. One explains. Yeah, one explains dark energy, one explains inflation. It's called chi. What differentiates them? And the answer is what differentiates them is their physics, right? Because the inflation needs to be very high energy and and uh, and its potential has to have a very high energy behavior. And that field needs to be dominant. And then in the late universe, it has to dump all its energy into the standard model to reheat the universe. And the, the dark energy field would have to not do that and would have to just slowly roll throughout the entire history of the universe. And so it's their physics. It's, you know, it's their, it's their, their, the energy scales that arise in their self interactions and the, the types of and sizes of their couplings to other fields. That's what distinguishes them from one It's a good question. And but that, that's what distinguishes them. So I just want to ask one question maybe here. So suppose you have a field, you start rolling during inflation, you have satisfied all the constraints and then you uh, produce the sufficient amount of reheating. And with that, is it possible yep. to get the late time acceleration as well? Yeah, so uh, your question, I think, is, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to cause my screen to, um, my screen just is being controlled by this remote. It's not, there we go. Um, so I think what you're asking is, could the same physics that's responsible for inflation, the same field, also be explained yeah. in the late time acceleration? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the answer is, you know, the answer is in principle, yes. And people have thought about that. There's an entire set of papers by, uh, the first paper from this is by Duncan and Peebles. And Blanket, it's called um, quintessential inflation. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you have a field that, you know, it's very high energy at early times and very low energy at late times. Mm -hmm. Problem that you might worry about. There are two things you might worry about in the market. One is a physics problem, and one is, if you like, a technical problem. The physics problem is I, you normally think of inflation as you roll slowly, then you dump all your energy into standard model particles by reheating. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, then the inflaton's gone. So how can it still be around to be the dark energy? Sure. And the way that you solve that in the question is that you have some other way of reheating the universe, maybe gravitationally by using the Hawking radiation of the change in space time between the two different evolutions. There are other ways too. Um, the, the technical question is how natural is it to have a potential that behaves this way and one way and down here in a different yeah. way. And that's quite hard to write down natural models that do. Um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, technically it's true. I mean, I think technically it's possible. The, the hard part as ever is writing down a compelling control whose quantum behavior is under control that you can ask the right questions about and get the answers that you trust from. Those things are always tricky. But like if, if you start with kind of two fields coupled to each other, so one field you call inflaton and another is the dark energy, uh, like whatever for the late time acceleration. So like you were saying that, like you, you have some action and at very high scale, the inflaton dominates and at very low scale, the other field dominates. So like that kind of formalism is also possible. It's possible, but again, the details really matter. And so let me explain what I mean by that, because it, it, it illustrates things to creating models. So either you tell me I have a field that gives me inflation and one that gives me late time acceleration and they don't interact, or, or maybe they only interact gravitationally, in which case that's, there's nothing new there, right? They're just, yes. or you let them interact. But if you let them interact, if you let them interact, then you have to worry that remember the thing that's going to give you late time acceleration, you want to have a very low mass and very flat potential and very low energy. You have to worry that now quantum corrections from this inflaton field and the interactions will ruin that. So mm. there are going to be tight constraints on how much they can be coupled. Okay. And so you really do have to, there, there are real constraints here. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like very interesting. Uh, who's this? I have a question. Shirish? Hello. Sir. Yes, yes. Have yeah, a question. So please ask question. So uh, you said something about the uh, the connection of galleons with host theory like cohomology. So can you just comment on that a little bit? I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not understanding. Can you say it again, please? Uh, you said something about relation with galleons of, with uh, cohomology. So can, yes. can you just comment on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, to some degree I will. Um, so, um, you know what West Amino terms are? Yes, yes. So, you know, West Amino terms were, let me, let me back up. In, in the strong interactions, you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking going on. And the low energy Goldstone bosons are the pions. And in that theory, if you try to, there, there's a, a well-known technique for writing down the effective field theory of a spontaneously broken field theory. And it's called the COSEC construction. And uh, if you do that in the strong interactions, you find every possible interaction that you could have, except one. You miss one. And the reason you miss interaction is a special one that, that uh, differs from, uh, that is not exactly invariant under the symmetry. It only in, varies up to a total derivative. And that term is what's called the West Amino term. And it turns out to be very important in the strong interactions if you can measure it. Um, I, I mean, I'm telling you things you know here. I just want to set it up to compare with what I want to tell you. Um, and in the West Amino model, Witten pointed out then that if you, you can think of the West Amino term as arising from a five dimensional construction. And when you think of doing that and pulling back to four dimensions, then really what your the classification of the terms that are allowed are, it's really, you know, the difference between exact and closed forms on this five-dimensional manifold. And that means that, it's, that those terms are classified by Gram cohomology. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. So it's like, yeah. and, and it's like supersymmetry is actually a quantum, uh, supersymmetry quantum theory actually a Dram cohomology, like you pointed out. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand that. I can say it again, please. Like supersymmetric quantum field theory is actually a Dram cohomology. Yeah, so 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 in, in, in the strong interactions, it's the Dram cohomology that matters. And there's a nice corollary to that that Witten realized, which is because of that topological uh, structure, the coefficients of the West Amino Witten terms are quantized. So in the Galilean theories, the Galilean symmetry is pi goes to pi plus a constant plus p mu x mu. So it's a non-linearly realized symmetry. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a shift, it's non-linearly realized. So non-linearly realized symmetries are what we mean by spontaneously broken symmetries. And so you can use the cosec construction, you can use the cosec construction to again, construct your theory. It's more complicated because you have a space-time symmetry here. It turns out that that's its own complexity, but you can, you can solve that problem. And indeed, you identify every term in the effective field theory except for the Galilean terms. The Galilean terms you miss because they shift by a total derivative and they are exactly the West Amino terms. But if you try to do the cohomology argument, the Witten argument, you find that the relevant mathematical structure that categorizes these objects is not the Durham cohomology of the Lie groups. It's not, and the reason is that you don't have that global structure because these things are space-time searches is a non-compact structure. What you end up is Lie algebra, relatively algebra cohomology that categorizes these terms. The, the, the analogous statement to Durham cohomology categorizing West Amino Witten terms in strong interactions in the pion theory is that relatively algebra cohomology, chevalier eilenberg cohomology is what categorizes the West Amino terms in the Galilean theory. And those, Gal, those West Amino terms are because of the cohomology, the, the coefficients are not quantized. Okay. Well, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I have to read a little bit. You, if you look at my papers, 
There's one, if you search for my papers with the title West Amino, you'll find only one paper. And in that paper, we go through this in excruciating detail. Oh, okay. Any further question you guys I have? Can... I will put this paper Yeah, you put the, put in the chat box, maybe they will collect it. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I guess I'm happy to stop. Yes, and uh, <coughs> I just want to last have one question, sorry. So like uh, there are a few theories people have written except by gravity Galileon. So the, those theories people have like, uh, uh, it's like more complicated version of uh, K essence theories. So people have written like Antonio Di Felice, Shinji Mukoyama. They they used to write very complicated Lagrangians, some L3, L4, L5, L6, and so on. Yep. Yeah. So like, do do you have any comment on that? Because they try to work on uh, like uh, try to study early universe, late time effects, a lot of things from that. So, yeah, I mean, those, those are interesting theories. I mean, I should say that since Felicia was my student and Fiyama is my collaborator, I should probably say nice things about their theories. Uh, they're, 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 they're good theories, they're, they're interesting theories. I mean, as I tried to point out in the talk, um, there are many, many ways to expand on the ideas that I gave you just here, the sort of basic, structure. Um, many of these extensions have an advantage that they, they evade some of the constraints that I talked about. For example, the, the constraint of not homogeneous, for example, in some the price you pay is complexity. The theories become complex and then be extra careful trying to make sure that you're theoretically uh, under control, that you're not in strong coupling regimes, and that you can make predictions. And I think it's very hard to make predictions right now from theories like that, but it doesn't mean that it's not worth pursuing them at some level. Yeah. But I don't have details to say about that. So thank you, Mark, for the contribution, and uh, it will be surely helpful for the students. And once it will be uploaded in YouTube, I will share the link with you. And thanks again. And uh, if you want to say something for the forum, you can say. Oh, I'd just say, I think this is a very nice thing that you're doing. I'm sure it's very useful for lots of students. I, I hope this presentation will be, and thank you for coming and good luck. Stay safe and healthy. So bye. You too. Yeah. Bye.